uh, the live streaming has started and it is exactly 11 o'clock. Surat sir, shall we start? Yeah. So we are ready. Can we have the link uh, to the live streaming in the chat box? Okay, sir, I'll put it. Vishy, sir, uh, we are good to go. So it is on the chat box, live stream. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would, I am Mrs. Aishwarya Nair, member of NITE Bioethics Steering Committee. Uh, on behalf of NITE deemed to be university, I would like to extend a very, very warm welcome to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Satish Kumar Vandari, sir, and our esteemed resource person, Dr. Animesh Jain, and our very, very motivating uh, Dr. Suraj Shetty, sir. Over to you, sir. For, we'll begin with the uh, guest lecture. I would like to call upon uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Satish Kumar Bhandari, sir, to please give opening remarks for our guest lecture. Very good morning. My good friend, uh, Dr. Hanimesh, head of the Mangalore Unit of International Chair of Bioethics and professor and head of the Department of Community Medicine, Kasturbo Medical College, my alma mater. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Animesh. Organizing okay. chairperson, uh, Dr. Suraj, and organizing uh, secretary, both are very dynamic, Dr. Suraj and Dr. Aisharya. Uh, uh, congratulate you for uh, organizing this uh, webinar on the eve of uh, World Bioethics Day celebration 2021. I... Uh, I congratulate uh, the team, the steering committee team and the, the student wing of the bioethics. We had a uh, morning, we had a uh, wonderful uh, program with uh, Professor Russell Rizolza uh, being the chief guest for this uh, that program. And we had a wonderful uh, prize distribution program and various events and new office bearers oath-taking ceremony also. I congratulate the new NITA bioethics uh, steering team and uh, uh, the student doing of the bioethics unit of NITE. In this, in this context, this uh, theme of this webinar, informed consent, uh, is very, very appropriate and very relevant. And uh, the talk uh, by Dr. Animesh will be really refreshing. And uh, definitely, I, uh, I, I'm very sure that our students and faculty will be benefited by his talk. The informed consent process, uh, I think, uh, when we are uh, students, it was not all that uh, very important informed consent, uh, in particularly in 
our subcontinent uh, but uh, it uh, gave grew up because of the social movement towards the greater autonomy and uh, particularly due to the recent advances in bio biomedical devices which have become life preserving and uh, the issues of ethical issues have become very relevant and the informed consent also very very important with informed consent the patient and the healthcare provider have got both have got very important role to play that's a very actually it's very symbiotic uh, relationship between the healthcare provider and the patient the important aspects of informed consent include uh, ethical obligations to promote autonomy and provide information relevant information and avoid any unethical forms of bias in when deciding a particular procedure or intervention medical intervention patients always have the right to refuse medical therapies whether on religious grounds or other grounds and provider cannot subject any patient uh, to certain even peri perioperative tests or preoperative tests without informed consent are not permitted understand and all the decisions should be we should involve the patient when making in uh, decision making when when particular procedure and another aspect of informed consent particularly for clinical trials when you talk about the clinical trials the very important event in the holocaust in the history it comes to our mind is the nuremberg uh, trial i think all of you are aware that uh, the nuremberg trial conducted after the second world war to enquire into the atrocities conducted by the nazi sympathizers on jewish prisoners in the concentration camp and it's really uh, very very uh, painful to hear that what happened during that event and uh, the inquiry uh, found 16 guilty of the 23 defendants in that trial and uh, seven received death sentences in that and nine had uh, life imprisonment and also it led to the formation of uh, 10 element nuremberg code which is where the one of the first step in the uh, uh, informed consent and uh, the valid that is the first uh, part of the uh, 10 element nuremberg code says voluntary consent is mandatory for doing any clinical trials on human subjects uh, though the this uh, informed consent is involves a lot of challenges it's an important tool for clinical trials which facilitates the entry of uh, for newer drug or any medical devices no research activity involving human subject can be conducted and proceeded without informed consent the right safety and well being of the trial subject should always be prevail over the interest of the science and the society so that a layman never feels being deceived of or let let down during this uh, trials the, by giving excuse of social cause the issue of consent uh, informed consent in india is a challenge according to me on the part of investigator as a lot of complexities are there in indian scenario many or regulations are based on western guidelines which do not necessarily reflect the requirements of our country the guidelines on informed consent in india should be based on complex factors which we we are leaving such as culture level of education demographics and risks involving the uh, during the uh, study and the necessity of this uh, trial or investigations i believe there will be a lot of queries by the participants to be answered by our learned speaker dr animesh jain i hope the all the participants will be benefited by this webinar and very carry very pleasant memories of uh, this day celebration with uh, this uh, webinar on informed consent i hope uh, all will enjoy wish you all the best i once again thank uh, the bioethics unit both uh, the steering committee and the student wing for uh, celebrating in very fruitful manner wish you all the best may god bless you thank you very much sir for your kind words and unnerving motivation so i would like to request dr suraj shetty sir to kindly introduce our esteemed speaker before i introduce our esteemed speaker uh, i myself being from uh, forensic medicine background i am an ethics edu educator so you know i could go on and on about informed consent but there is one uh, particular statement that uh, caught my attention 
recently, uh, which stresses upon the importance of uh, informed consent. It says, without much exaggeration, it can be said that all of medical ethics is but a footnote to informed consent. That one statement uh, emphasizes the importance of uh, informed consent in today's practice. So I believe uh, you know, all the students will be able to uh, take back uh, important notes from this and uh, they become sensitive to these issues. Having said that, let me introduce our, you know, esteemedly, you know, uh, our accomplished speaker, Dr. Animesh Jain, who is uh, HOD in community medicine in uh, KMC Manglo. He has also done uh, a diploma in uh, family health and he's a FIMR fellow and he's finished his uh, advanced course in medical education in 2015. Apart from that, he is also holding a diploma in uh, uh, bioethics and medical ethics from uh, Center for Ethics, Yanapoya University. He is the head of the Mangalore Unit of International Chair in Bioethics. He is the deputy coordinator of uh, Medical Education Unit of KMC Mangalore. He is the advisors for, advisor for Mahe Students Research Forum. And he is the innovation ambassador for Ministry of Education, Government of India from KMC Manglo. Apart from that, he is the mentor supervisor for Web of Science of uh, Pablons Academy. He has been awarded the best innovative teaching in community medicine uh, via the IAPSM 2019. He is the faculty at uh, Faimar Regional Institute in uh, Koimatur as well as uh, Manipal. He is the editor of uh, Journal of Environmental and Public Health and he is the honorary secretary. He has been the honorary secretary of IMA Mangalore from 2020 to 2021. He has, uh, apart from this, he has interest in things like uh, photography. He's a, he's a renowned philatelist and he's an avid traveler. And he's also a member of various bodies like Asia Pacific Travel Health Society, Southeast Asian Regional Association for Medical Education, uh, IAPSM, that is Indian Association of Preventive and Social Medicine, Indian Public Health Association, and he's a part of Forum for Ethics Review, Review Committee in India. So that is a, a very brief introduction I've given. I'm sure there's more to uh, his uh, accomplishments. But with that, I will uh, over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Suraj and Dr. Ashwarya. And my... Uh, Thanks to Dr. Satish Bhandari sir for being very kind. I have been his student and uh, I always remember him with fond memories as well as my association later in different forums, including the Indian Medical Association and also in the bioethics forums. So thank you and thank you Nite University for giving me this opportunity. What I'll do is over the next 40 to 45 minutes, I will try to you know, give you an idea about informed consent and the issues related to privacy and confidentiality. And then obviously we will take some questions and that, that's where I, I look forward to a lot of, uh, in case there is some query or discussion happening that will enrich people. So that's my idea. So I would try to keep it a little restricted to you know, talking from my side. Of course, I will give you some overview and then some of these things might be known but probably from a different perspective, you'll get an idea. So with that, I would like to share my slide and please let me know once you see it. Is this, are yes, the slide? Sir. Yeah, so yes. slide is visible and obviously I'm audible. Right, and just one correction. I used to be the head of department uh, from last year onwards. Uh, we have a rotation policy and I, I have somebody else. So I'm a professor and I'm happy to contribute in my capacity now. So when we go into this very often heard terms, uh, I'm not sure if we have the provision to get, you know, the chat from the, the, this, uh, the YouTube, but if not, uh, probably I will move forward. Is there a provision or something here for this? Uh, as in when any questions are posted, I will post it in our chat box, yes. All right, okay. Right, so the chat probably like what I'll do is I'll, I'll move on. So privacy and confidentiality usually is a very often heard term, but 
what happens is many times we don't realize we have seen this but we don't realize it so basically i would try to give you an idea of this and why this is important is because informed consent also has some relation to this as well so privacy is nothing but the right of an individual to decide or control what information that we can collect from that person so if i am the person in question it is my right to decide whether i want to part with an information which is pertaining to me and if at all if that information is given can it be stored and by whom it can be stored you know who can be party to that uh, information who can be uh, knowing about that information when it is shared so i have that right and that's the right to privacy as opposed to that what is confidentiality so once i share that information so i disclose it with somebody now it's the obligation of that particular organization or the research team or the researcher that this information stays safe so my information has gone to somebody i i'm taking this example to simplify the concept so that's confidentiality so in other words what information or in case of we are talking about in case uh, to understand better if i'm talking of clinical examination so when we examine a patient we don't do it in open in everybody's full view we usually take them or take him or her to a room or at least put a screen or two and then ensure especially when it's, a, it's an examination which may be intimate so we will do that and we will give them privacy so that not everybody sees that similarly after doing that examination if i have certain findings i don't go and announce it that oh so and so i examine and this is what so i am keeping that information confidential i may discuss with my team of people who are going to treat it and that's what is confidentiality just to give you an overview of that so privacy usually pertains to person whereas confidentiality pertains to data so pp privacy person and confidentiality data cd so that's how it is now how do we safeguard it it can have multiple ways i don't obviously indiscriminately inform everybody or disclose it i can give a secure access by putting it like in case i'm doing a, you know a data collection so i can keep it in lock and key and that will have access only to some people who can authorize uh, be authorized to give uh, the key and then take that or it could be in, in say domains where we have it online so again only a few people get an access and it's not everybody so that is again the way we so why do we need to you know have privacy so obviously we don't want everybody to know about us or certain things may not be you know uh, very comfortable to be known by everybody until unless it's required so we need to have that and what information about one's self should be or should not be known to others is prerogative of one self so that's obviously uh, a human thing to do when we have this information again that has to be confidential so it cannot be breached but only in certain conditions it can be breached. of course uh, sometimes we may have challenges and limitations and how do we explain that to the participant or the person is important we should ensure confidentiality as much as possible but then there may be sometimes challenges now it also applies to certain other things when we have photographs we have information in the form of photographs it could be my uh, investigation report certain other things so anything that i want to especially when i'm talking in terms of research now so publication which comes out it should uphold the privacy and that's why you would have seen that even identity is tried to be masked and so those things are there again if at all there are certain things which we consented for and then i want to digress from there i need to have a reconsent as per the guidelines so i would require reconsent for publication if i'm going to publish something which i had not taken consent from and which has a potential for probably a, a kind of exploitation or probably even uh, something which i have and then i have not taken consent for that need to be taken for and then there may be sensitive information so again i don't want my participant or the, the subject to be discriminated or stigmatized so that also that's the reason why i need to look at these things so obviously i need not discriminate between people 
but at the same time i should not openly talk about anything and everything that i have and that is what so what i could also do is i could anonymize that means i removed any kind of identifiable information and that is confidentiality so only in certain situations when there is a public health risk or a threat to person's life or community's life or it could be court of laws you know the uh, orders that i can actually reveal this there are even samples which are there if there is no identifier present it is anonymous or unidentified sample or there may be present and i what i do is i remove that the identify them so i don't keep that label and that now in this again we can have a de labeling in such a way that i can re link back so i keep a key or it's irreversibly anonymized that means after that you cannot go back and say that this belongs to this person so i could do that also and of course it's identifiable means now let me go into the main topic uh we'll try to look at why informed consent what type of research or what kind of studies do we need to have uh informed consent what are the types of consent we'll look at and if at all we can have a waiver of consent so please remember one thing which some people always have question about is can we start a study before we have applied for ethics approval can we start now data collection so ideally we are not supposed to and this is very very important that's why in red no study can be started prior to iec approval in you know institutional ethics committee's approval so we need to wait for that and obviously informed consent process is a built in thing in the protocol so that obviously will be you know reviewed by the ethics committee and then we get an approval for that or if at all an amendment to be done so what is informed consent there could be various ways it can be defined however it's a process of agreeing to take part in a study when it comes in context of a research based on access to all the relevant and easily digestible information and what is this information about please remember this information has to be relevant and easily digestible why because this is for the general public or people who may not have as much intellect as us as medical professional or researchers so this should be easily digestible to the people who are going to be enrolled and particularly we have to pay attention to we have to outline what are the harms and the benefits so that is very very important so voluntarily the participant will confirm the willingness to participate and this is usually documented by means of a written signed and dated informed consent form usually we get misled that you know that's because the paper is there so it's not that it's a process it's a whole process and please remember this whole thing that means the participant information sheet and the information that we provide them and the part the form together constitute something known as informed consent documents so it's not just the, that form which they sign but it's also the information that has to be there now let's look at this and i would be happy if i can get some responses from the chat and then maybe uh, dr suraj or ashwarya can let me know if at all okay okay sir so this is a case of mrs franklin who's a elderly alzheimer's patient 81 year old and she is hospitalized under the care of a physician maybe you and we want this lady to take part in a clinical trial which is about a new drug which has been designed to improve memory as you know alzheimer's lead to loss of memory so when the clinical investigator was taking the consent and you were present to see that witness that however later you visit mrs franklin and you say are you ready to begin the study tomorrow and she stares blankly at you as if you're speaking greek and latin she doesn't know what you're speaking so she has no idea now what do you do any responses please let me know yes sir i'll also try to in such a scenario what should be done do we have any responses not yet i guess none yet sir 
Okay, I am also seeing so legally authorized representative yes. is needed. All right. Yes, any other? So do you think that we can take consent from this lady? It was already taken. Do you think there is any issue with that? You were present when the informed consent was taken and it was signed by Mrs. Franklin? So when a child who's already enrolled in a study reaches the legal age of consent, what happens? So this is something which we will look at, okay? Here, okay, let's look at case two. There is a study which involved collection of tissue from the subjects and investigator wishes to perform some additional analysis because this tissue sample is now archived. Now this in, in the original consent form, it was not stated and this was not said that, you know, we are going to do this particular analysis, which we are adding on now. Do you think that we need to have informed consent or consent for the new research again? So what uh, response for this? So I do see that, you know, Dr. Babu has again said that in the previous case, that lady belonged to the vulnerable group. Yes, okay. Good. Sir, even here, uh, assess her capacity to consent. Dr. Shishir Kumar has. Okay, okay. Right. So, assess her capacity to consent. Okay, good. What about this case? Do we need to have a consent again? Okay, so let's move on. We will get the idea and we will revisit these. Remind me if I don't. So basically, the informed consent has certain elements and these are the elements. So it consists of disclosure, understanding, the capacity or the competence of the participant and voluntariness. Now let's try to take these. So disclosure means we are going to give the information. So we have to give all the information. Now the thing is, we may give information. But if I give all the information, does it make some sense? The, does the participant understand? So we have to check for that as well. So disclosure is not one-sided. It has to be also checked for understanding. And, there has to be, and it should be made simple, as I already said. Another thing is there should be a competence or the capacity for the person to come to consent. First to understand and obviously to consent. So in this first case, if you look at, since she did not have that capacity because she had Alzheimer's and, and she has, you know, those intervals where she may be forgetful. So we cannot take consent. And as rightly said, we have to take it from a surrogate consent, from a legally authorized representative or maybe the kith and kin. The understanding again, and if it is a complex thing, we should ideally build in a mechanism where we ask for or check for their understanding. In fact, even in internet consent, it's advised that we have certain tests and sometimes what they do is they have these tests built in where they will check for, for the previous information which is given, there will be one or two questions. Once you get that correct, you move on further. So that information can be broken into chunks if it's a complex thing. And of course, it has to be voluntary. We cannot persuade, we cannot coax, we cannot coerce somebody to get into this. So it has to be voluntarily given. So it cannot be that if you don't do this, you will have consequences. If you do not consent to be in part of you know, my trial, being the physician, treating physician, I will not see you or maybe I will delay your appointments or something. So it cannot be on that, you know, it cannot be done that way. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but that's... So what are the elements? So if you look at, basically, uh, there are certain elements that are supposed to be there. And if you see on the left column, all the elements of an informed consent document are there, which are essential. Whereas on your right are actually the, the additional elements. So these are the additional elements which are optional and depends on case to case basis. But as per ICMR guidelines of 2017, all these left side things like it, it's a statement which says very explicitly that this is research that you're getting into so that there's no confusion because sometimes, especially in clinical trials, people get confused and they think they are getting into some treatment or a new drug, but actually it's a trial. 
the purpose and the methods, what is the duration of the, the research, what will be the frequency, if at all, any visits or whatever, uh, and what are the methods involved, what are the benefits which are expected, if any, to the participant or community or others, is there any risk which can be foreseen, any discomfort, any inconvenience, that should also be explicitly stated, how the records will be maintained as confidential, so that covered on that. Then if any kind of a reimbursement or payment is promised, so that should also be mentioned. And if at all there is an injury, what would be the treatment given? What would be the compensation given? All that has to be stated here in the informed consent itself, the, the information which is given to the participant for informed consent. And who are the people? This is one thing which I've seen. Who are the people behind this? So I have seen many of these, especially in the last COVID times, a lot of Google forms circulating without any information about this being researched sometimes or many times, most of the times I saw, there was no identity of the research team. Now, especially when it goes viral from one person to another, another to, we don't even know who's behind it. I may have received from some fourth, fifth, third person or whoever person, but I don't know who's the person who's actually behind this. And of course, to freedom to participate or withdraw anytime. And again, alternative procedures, insurance, all that is optional, depending on what is the nature and any biological material, what are the plans for research benefit sharing, any publication plans, all that are additional elements. Now I'm just showing because I mentioned Google form. This is like, you know, Google form just to give you an idea. So again, I'll give you the, the you know, the screenshots in uh, detail. So this was one of the research which we undertook. So here you see first itself we are mentioning that this is a team of investigators from this institution. We will come up with the identity at the end of this. So this is a research that we are doing. It will take about five to 10 minutes. This has been approved by the Institutional Ethics Committee. It's a good idea to mention that you can even go forward and say that, you know, this is the, the, the reference number of the approval and what else to be done. So this whole statement talks about this. So this gives you an idea that this is a research. Then how does your participation help? So this is again explicit. And this is a part of the initial part of the Google form itself. And then what are you supposed to do? So if you agree to participate, you'll be given so many questions. Your name or any identifier is not required. You shall remain anonymous. So that promise is made. And then the data obtained will be confidential and protected. So that's also there in the next. It will be used only for research purpose and the data uh, will be stored on secure servers, will be accessible only to researchers. So as I was mentioning, so all that is there and it does not cause any expense, does not lead any harm to you. At the end, we are also giving them, you know, you have the right to refuse participation. Though we are not offering any kind of financial incentive, but we will give you links to official sites so that you uh, get information. And then... Who are the people behind? So as I was saying, so these are the people behind and the contact address of the uh, ethics committee is given. So you need not give always the phone number. You can always, and especially if you have a Google form, people can obviously uh, be tech savvy to reach out. And then there is a consent. You can even make it explicit, but that all the elements should be there. And then once to, they go through this, they have to say that I voluntarily agree and then only proceed forward. Another thing which I saw is some of the forms had this, or they had an option of yes or no. When you click no, still you move on to the next. Ideally, it should not be. So you have to design the Google form has an option. Where they say no, they, they go to submit. They cannot move to your questionnaire. Because once I do not agree to participate or do not consent, why should I go to the... Because the moment I do that, then I'm obviously going to be moving up. I will probably fill up. So once I say no to consent, no to agreeing to participate, I should not move on to the next section. And that's something which we need to look at. And all these are made explicit that, you know, this is what my rights are. And then that, that participant is getting into it. So even with Google Form, and then for complicated things, as I said, you can even give chunks of information, check for their understanding by asking some questions. So of course it looks, looks a little difficult, but then all this is possible even in a simple Google Form. Now let's move on to some of the special circumstances. So if we have differently abled or the Bianks as we call them now, so these people also should be, you know, given additional protection. So how do we do that? 
there should be appropriate methods built in to enhance the participants understanding like for example visually impaired can be assisted with braille so they can be given that information uh there should not be any restriction just because they are from you know differently able or special category people so so they should be given all the rights and they should be given the freedom to discuss with family friends before they come into a decision to participate especially in clinical trials especially in uh, trials where they will require a consistent or maybe a invasive kind of a thing so yes that has to be given to the right has to be given to them then there should not be any unjustifiable assurance which will influence or intimidate participant to get into the study and we have to ensure that the participant is competent and gives the consent voluntarily if at all they are illiterate then there should be a person who is a literate impartial witness should be present and they should witness the whole process so that is again and that should be again endorsed with a signature so that is ideally recommended as i said sometimes even sometimes for some complicated or sensitive studies because ideally what we do is we just say that we have provided and then everybody is just signed or something but when the problems arise all this come into play so just to be on the safer and the best procedure ideal procedure is to test for their understanding and document it especially in sensitive studies so the test can be repeated if we ideally as bandari sir was saying in our country it will be very difficult because we have a very diverse and a very different kind of a population so we'll have to look at some ways because our population most of them are illiterate low socio economic and so a lot of challenges this may be very good for certain western society but but we have to come out with ways and if you see recent covid vaccine there were some issues in some of these uh, cities where they said i think there were reports about you know some cities where they said they never knew that they were getting into a trial they thought they were being given vaccine and they went and got the vaccine thinking that the vaccine covid vaccine is being given yes of course it was given but there were two arms there was a, a arm where there was even a placebo which was given so there could be issues like that and later that can come up with big controversies also so we have to be careful about it when a participant is willing to participate but sometimes there might be insensitive issues they are not willing to sign or they are not willing to give a thumb impression being illiterate so in such cases we have a provision to have a oral or verbal consent but please remember as a researcher as an investigator i cannot decide it it has to be by the approval prior approval of ethics committee and by justifying that this is why in fact sometimes it can be even documented by an audio or a video record if required but please remember these kind of things are only an exception and this can be justified only in exceptional circumstances and with the approval of ies so that has to be remembered we talked about the second case so yes reconsent should be so when do we take a reconsent or a fresh consent when a new information becomes available so that time we need to take a reconsent or there was a participant when we started off and that person was unconscious but regained consciousness or probably the person gets a mental competence over a period of time when they we have enrolled and is able to understand the implication of research so that time we will have to have a reconsent somebody asked me this so child becomes an adult during the course of study so then we will need to take a, a fresh consent okay if it's a long term follow up or requires extension things have changed or there is a change in treatment modality procedures maybe the data collection methods or the site visits have increased or decreased or the the amount of time we expect participation has changed that may probably uh, impact the decision of the participant to continue in the research or not so at that time we take consent again so these are the guidelines which are there for pre consent if at all we feel that there is a possibility of disclosure of identity by means of photographs or data presentation which generally should be camouflaged camouflaged so that we don't disclose as i said we have to protect so again we need to take a pre consent and sometimes we might even need to have a look at taking a partner or a spouse consent also because sometimes that could also be an issue 
Now, what are these other special circumstances? So there is something known as passive consent. I'm sure that you know some of you would have heard of it. What is this passive consent? So let me give you an example. I want to do a survey in a school. As it is, the school is having an annual health checkup camp. As a part of this, when we visit, I want to collect some information. It could be anything. It could be on a particular behavior. It could be, you know, dental caries, anything. Now, what I could do is I'm doing a routine examination and just as a part of this, I'm collecting and I'm, I'm not going to have any kind of a, a link data or I would rather anonymize. I will present that data or analyze the data as an anonymous data, as a group, not as a particular individual. So what I could do is if I, one is the routine, I send a consent form with information and I expect the participants, that is the students to carry it home through the school and the parents to give consent. That is one. But I could also do it other way. So I say all this information is provided as a part of routine testing, we are going to do it and we are going to collect and this information will be compiled and we will use it for you know research purpose, maybe also presentation and other. However, if you do not want your child to participate, please return this form. Else it is like, you know, we think that if at all they don't return it, then we will enroll the child. Because anyway, we are going to enroll that child for uh, the health checkup. So here, this is passive. That means if you don't do anything, it's understood that you are participating. But if you return that form, that means you don't want your child to participate. So you sign it. Surrogate consent is the first case, as I mentioned. So there are some other places where the participant cannot consent. So there is a legally authorized representative or any kith and kin can consent in certain cases, we require that. Is there something known as community consent? So it was there in the previous ICMR document. The current document doesn't emphasize much, but previous. So there may be some times where there are gatekeepers. That means village head, you know, elderly people, punch, whoever, or tribal leaders. So there we probably need their approval to get into that area because if they don't endorse, if they don't approve, we may not be able to get into. So that's more of like, but even in such, we expect that each participant is again talked about and told about what they are getting into. Can we waive consent? So this is again one of the questions which perplexes many people. So yes, there is a provision. Again, it's an exception, but yes, it, there is a provision only in certain situations justifiably done and with the prior approval of the ethics committee. So these are the conditions. Where can we get a waiver of consent? So research will not be able to be carried out or practically possible without the waiver. And the waiver is scientifically justified. Sometimes very sensitive studies, HIV related, some stigmatizing conditions. Yes, there may be like, and we can justify. Or if there is, you know, where we have a retrospective study where the participants are de-identified or cannot be contacted, it's age-old data, or there are samples which are anonymized, as I've already told you, so you de-link them. And we do not have any means to. But again, here the implication can be, if we have a commercial interest or commercially exploitable potential, like what happened in HeLa cells, we will have to again look at that. So that's why the ethics committee has to examine case to case and then decide on this. Or there could be public health studies or surveillance, which is ongoing, program evaluation. Those things, we can have no concern because that's a part of the public health uh, processes. And we are not individualizing, it's a group data or overall data. Or data which is available in public domain any kind of humanitarian agents, uh, a kind of humanitarian uh, emergencies or disasters. But here there is a clause that once we have got the opportunity to get the participants consent, we should try and do that at the earliest. So in certain situations when the participant is not able to consent, that time in humanitarian emergency and disaster, we should go for this waiver of consent. Again, with the you know, expedited and full approval of the ethics committee, provisional approval. A word on electronic consent and which became much more important during the pandemic times uh, recently. So here there was a guidance document which came even from ICMR, a 20 odd page booklet, which talked about electronic consent for a change and a pleasant you know, observation. So they talked about uh, you know, alternative procedures. 
where there may not be possibility of direct interaction. And, and even we use Zoom and other things actually to do some interviews qualitative. So here we can do all these things and there could be electronic tools which can be used. Right now we are addressing this through a webinar in normal times, we would have not thought about it, but then that's possible. There could also be you know, methods where we can even verify uh, the digital signatures can be taken, of course, complicated and some simple things may not require it, but at least some way to capture that, yes, this person is given. So even a Google form sometimes can even capture. So that can be, uh, can be capturing the, the email where it's originating. So that could be there. And the process can be documented even by audio or video recording, if at all required, not necessarily every time. So that has been. Now let's look at another aspect, assent. Now in cases of children, we take something known as assent. So we are getting their approval and that's all coming from again, the principle of autonomy, whether it's the informed consent or the assent. So how do we protect the right of children? So obviously informed uh, consent is there uh, where we are taking from the adults and we have the, the IEC approval that is ethics committee approval, which gives us a societal uh, approval and uh, protection. But when we involve children, we need to take assent. And assent is nothing but when we involve children, we are trying to get there. And it's a very simplified document, very simplified document, simply written, similar to the, the documents for informed consent, where we have an information sheet and a consent form. So similarly, you have an assent form. So ICMR guidelines say that for children seven to 18 years, we need to take assent. However, further, there are two categories. So seven years to 12 years, we need to take a verbal assent. Whereas when it is child who is 12 years and above, up to 18 years before he or she becomes adult, we need to take a simplified written assent. Below seven years, obviously no assent is required. But please remember when we take assent also, we need to take the consent of the parent, guardian or the legally authorized representative. So it has to be along with consent from a legally authorized representative or a consent from a parent or a guardian and the child's assent. Now, if at all the child is incompetent medically or legally, then legally authorized representative's consent is required. We can even have electronic consent, as I've already told, and individual consent is required. It's important. Please remember, if we get consent from parent, but the child refuses assent, we cannot proceed. If the child gives assent and the parent refuses consent or the authorized representative refuses consent, we cannot proceed. So it's an all or none phenomenon. So we have to have both the assent and the consent from the parent or guardian or the legally authorized representative to enroll children and proceed with the, the study. So that is something which has to be there. So I would like to end here and take some questions, but I would like to you know, uh, give you this nice picture, which I feel is the essence captured in a very nice way. And this is thanks to our former additional dean and professor of surgery, Dr. Alfred Augustine, who in his address simplified and put this because you know children or students will understand this better. So consent is like fries, which obviously French fries are very favorite among most of the youngsters. So I love fries. So it signifies fries is in you know a short form or acronym, freely given. So consent should be freely given. It's it's voluntary. It's reversible. So I can withdraw at any time. I can refuse participation halfway through. It's informed. So I have all the information. I have been informed. I'm enthusiastic. I'm, I'm willingly participating and it's specific. And that's why reconsent is required. So it's specific to a particular thing. So I love fries. Of course, people may say that, you know, I'm trying to propagate junk food, but that's not the idea just to give you this in a simplified way. So I'll stop here. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, let's hope that, you know, I have tried to give you an overview in brief about the informed consent procedures and the, the requirements in research. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for the amazing uh, presentation. You have truly covered a lot of aspects in a very good manner that could reach, I hope, all the participants in a very fruitful way. Um, we would now like to take questions. Dr. Suraj. Yeah, uh, there has been one question. I think sir has already answered that. Uh, that was about uh, 
child reaching a legal age for consent and there was uh, one more question regarding the validity of pre printed consent form in patient care okay so recently i think uh, dr sudhir is better equipped to answer that i think there was a judgment which was saying that you know we should not have a pre printed it should be tailor made for each of the things uh, correct me if i'm wrong dr sudhir yes, but this is what yeah and i don't have immediately but i have that reference also somewhere but yes uh, that has been the judgment so they said that you know it should not be a blanket thing it should be for each of the things and tailor made so that's what is the uh, the and please remember when we talk of ethics we also have to remember the law of the land so we cannot be at loggerheads with the law of the land we have to comply with the law, law of the land as well so that's why some of these ethical guidelines which have evolved over a period of time but we also have to take into account the the legal procedures and the, the legalities so as i said it cannot be just a, a pre printed blanket thing uh, dr suraj maybe you can add if you want yes sir uh, a pre printed consent form doesn't have any legal standing in the court of law so uh, as i said informed consent that is what makes it fundamental both medico legally as well as bioethical thank you so uh, no more questions okay uh, uh, yes sir thank you for the was... lucid presentation was there any other question i'm sorry uh, yes sir so in the google sheet one was there when would a consent be held invalid okay so uh there could be multiple things but if you see that's why i showed you the essential elements now if it doesn't satisfy any of them like you know if we can say that the person did not understand and that's why that understanding is or if did not have the capacity to consent so all these will make it invalid like in that case that's why i showed you that alzheimers now that consent is not really valid because she is not competent enough to to give consent similarly in certain cases when so there are some mental illnesses where they may not be competent enough so there it can be invalid so these are some of the the uh, things so we have to look at in perspective where we have and of course whether the information provided was adequate enough so that also can be challenged now if i just give a very minimal information and later if there is something and see all this when it comes to four years or when we start talking about these things is only things when the things go wrong whether it was you know you look at that cervical vaccine uh, cervical cancer vaccine which went wrong in in uh, andhra pradesh or hyderabad there was something in regional cancer center in trivandrum so when that comes and then again now with media and now social media it, it becomes a big issue otherwise if nothing happens all fair but once things go wrong then only so that's why it's always good that we actually are on the right footing right from the beginning and we know these things we do the things in a right way once we do things in right way obviously uh, there is no issue thank you very much sir i think there are no more questions sir okay uh, thank you thank you sir uh, thank you, thank thank you, you so for much, uh, you know, uh, bringing up the concept of electronic consent and assent in 7 to 12 year old and about 12 year old the simplified written assent part thank you for uh, uh, informing us on these things uh, over to dr aishwarya for uh, the vote of thanks thank you so much sir uh, a very good afternoon to everyone after a truly eventful bioethics day and an enriching guest lecture uh, i would it is my honor to propose the vote of thanks for this event I am Dr. Aishwarya Nair, member of NITE Bioethics Steering Committee and Assistant Professor NITE Dean to be University. Firstly, I would like to thank our dynamic Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Satish Kumar Bhandari Sir, for his constant support throughout the organization of this event. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Animesh Jain Sir, Professor and former HOD of Community Medicine, KMC Mangalore. for rendering his invaluable knowledge and enriching us with information thank you sir 
I would like to thank Dr. Suraj Shetty, Associate Professor, Department of Forensic Medicine, for his guidance and goodwill, which made this event a true success. I would like to humbly thank the staff development cell of Nite Deem to be University for their exquisite coordination and prompt response that laid down the framework for this event. I would like to thank our Nite IT department for their cooperation in setting up the virtual platform for the flawless execution of the event. I would like to thank the students wing of Nite Biotech Steering Committee for their enthusiasm, creativity, and support. I would like to thank all the participants, all the members of Nite Bioethics Steering Committee, all the heads of institutions and departments, and the staff and students of Nite deemed to be university for rendering their support through participation. Thank you so much, sir. It was always a pleasure to hear you talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Have a good day. Participants kindly note that the feedback link has been posted in the comment section on YouTube. Kindly give in your valuable feedback. Certificates will be um, sent to you once the feedback form is submitted. Okay. Uh, on behalf of uh, NITE Bioethics Unit, let me profusely thank uh, Aishwarya Nair she has been a great help and she is instrumental in you know uh, this program so thank you miss aishwarya nash thank you sir thank you happy to help so we can end i think yes sir thank so you i'll be contacting you anyway thank you so much thank, thank you, you so sir. much thank you thank you dr suraj Thank you, uh, Dr. Ashrita. Thank you, Dr. Shishir, for joining.